Perfect. All right. So let's talk about this. Oh, me. No, me. What are we talking about here? All right. And I changed my background. Still in San Antonio, though. So it's time to evolve, redefining coronary ischemia. So when we think about the spectrum of coronary ischemia, I sort of envision it as this um, paradigm. And so we've got STEMI at the top, occupying the most important position, and then end STEMI under that, unstable angina falls below that. And lastly, we have stable angina, which we chatted about a little bit um, earlier. And we see a fair number of the top three, not a much of the, of the last um, diagnosis. But really the question is, is how did STEMI achieve this sort of esteemed position at the top of the pyramid? So we know that reperfusion of acute coronary occlusion improves mortality and morbidity. And in the thrombolytic era in the 1980s and 1990s when fashion was amazing, we found that patients with ST elevation on ECG benefited most from a mortality standpoint from pharmacologic thrombolysis. So acute coronary occlusion and reperfusion standards kind of became synonymous with ST elevation or STEMI. And then we made the leap that everything that isn't STEMI, that isn't ST elevation, isn't full coronary occlusion or acute coronary occlusion. And therefore, does it need reperfusion therapy? Now, you don't have to be a genius to realize that those kind of mental leaps just aren't true. So ST elevation doesn't always mean acute coronary occlusion. We've all sort of had to field the phone call from the interventionalist that we woke up at 3 a.m., you know, who's like, mm, nope, nothing, nothing to stent. Um, and it was a patient who had ST elevation on their ECGs. And acute coronary occlusion isn't always manifest by ST elevation, but somehow this model stuck. Now, we know better at this point, And hopefully, as we sort of enter this new age and you know, can develop a new paradigm, we can do better. We're realizing, for example, that when you look at this ECG, this is not just not a STEMI, right? There's a distinct pattern here that is concerning. These are hyperacute T waves. And in fact, this is De Winters. These are De Winters waves. And so this is not just slapping on a diagnosis of N STEMI and sending the patient upstairs to telemetry or to the CCU, but we can do better. And so we really need to start thinking about moving away from this STEMI versus N STEMI dichotomy to something new. Now, interestingly, the ACC AHA guidelines gave us a peek into which sort of NSTEMI patients deserve some kind of reperfusion therapy. So they categorize patients that have NSTEMI and are diagnosed as NSTEMI um, into an immediate invasive strategy, which means under two hours, so similar to STEMI management, patients who have refractory angina, patients who have recurrent angina, patients who have a bad dysrhythmia, so sustained VTEC or VFib, and patients who are unstable. Now, as you can see, these guidelines have not been updated in about seven years. The Europeans updated their guidelines within the last year, and they added heart failure, which is clearly related to whatever acute coronary process is happening in the moment as an indication for immediate invasive uh, therapy. And then ST elevation in AVR or V1 um, with diffuse ST depressions as also um, being deserving of immediate invasive therapy. Now, what about an early invasive strategy? So early invasive means two to 24 hours, and that's going to be patients who have dynamic ECGs, new ST depressions, and rising troponins. Next, we have kind of the wastebasket of everybody else. So delayed invasive strategy. So now we're pushing the envelope to 24 to 72 hours. And that's going to be our high-risk patients. So diabetics, CKD, our patients with heart failure who have EFs less than 40%, patients who've had a cabbage or PCI within the last six months, and patients who have had an MI and are coming in with pain. So these patients we can sit on for 72 hours before they get their invasive strategy. Now, back in 2017, there was this meta-analysis that gets quoted all the time. It was seven studies, 40,000 NSTEMI patients. And what they did was they looked at the CATH results for these patients and found that 10,000 patients, 
or a whopping basically 25% of patients had a completely occluded culprit artery. These are non-STEMI patients that had a completely occluded culprit artery, 25% of patients. And these patients ended up having more major adverse cardiovascular events, and they had almost double the mortality in the short term and long term as compared to the NSTEMI patients that didn't have this occlusive disease. So now we know there's a subset of patients that we're currently categorizing as non-STEMI that have the exact same pathology as STEMI patients, but are not getting the same timely and aggressive reperfusion therapy that we provide the STEMIs. And that's what became the spark for a new paradigm. And so what is this new paradigm? It's the OMI NOMI paradigm. So occlusive myocardial infarction versus non-occlusive myocardial infarction, moving away from the STEMI and STEMI dichotomy. And a lot has been written about this. MCRIT has a fantastic post that does a deep dive into the literature that supports this new paradigm. Steve Smith posted this on his blog post as well. We've covered it on the Rebel site. And so it's really time for us to move toward this new paradigm. What is this new paradigm? So let me take you through it just very briefly. So you have patients who have acute MI, okay? And typically, you know, at this point, we would start to stratify them into STEMI or NSTEMI. What this new paradigm tells us to do is instead, let's think about who do we suspect is going to have an occlusive myocardial infarction versus non-occlusive myocardial infarction. Now, the occlusive myocardial infarction patients are going to be the patients that were historically STEMIs, so they met STEMI criteria, but it also takes into consideration patients who have occlusive disease but don't necessarily have the ECG findings that fit STEMI criteria but still deserve emergent reperfusion therapy. So how does the OMI NOMI paradigm perform against the STEMI and STEMI uh, paradigm? Are we able to catch more occlusive MI patients by changing our criteria for immediate reperfusion? Well, Pendle Myers and Steve Smith, who wrote all the blog posts and really have done um, the bulk of the research in here, specifically looked at this question. They prospectively collected a cohort of consecutive patients who presented to the Stony Brook um, Emergency Department with symptoms concerning for possible ACS. This was a sub-study of a larger study, which is the Domi Aragato study, which we're going to... Um, talk about later, um, we're gonna talk about in a minute. And patients were either um, consulted um, for cardiology input or admitted to the cardiology um, service with possible ACS and they were scheduled for urgent or emergent cardiac cath. Now, 96% of the patients ended up going for cath. So 448 of the 467 patients eventually went for cath. 108 of these patients had occlusive myocardial infarction on the cath. Of that 108 that had occlusive disease, only 67 had ST elevation on their ECG that met STEMI criteria. So that's 41 patients that did not have ST elevation on their ECG that meet STEMI criteria, yet had occlusive myocardial infarction. That's a huge number. So that leaves 41 patients or 38% that had occlusive MI and no ST elevation. We cannot afford to miss these patients. The median time between arrival and cath for the STEMI positive occlusive MIs, 41 minutes. This is easy for us. We have great protocols in place and things move so smoothly when STEMIs roll in. In fact, we have an attending who tells us STEMIs are boring because they just kind of come in and they leave immediately. Now, the median time between arrival and cath for the occlusive MI patients, so we're talking about the same pathology that STEMI patients have, they had occlusive disease, but no STEMI criteria on their ECG, 437 minutes. And in fact, this group, only 28% of patients made it to the cath lab in under 90 minutes, which is the standard for STEMI and occlusive MI. So this is brutal data. 
So now what does this all mean in terms of the sensitivity of ST elevation in diagnosing occlusive MI? It's terrible. And so this is now the Domo Arigato study I mentioned earlier. This was a retrospective case control of patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome. And the investigators led again by Pendle Myers searched the cardiac cath uh, lab activation database from both Stony Brook and Hennepin County over a one year period. And they were looking at patients who were also admitted to the card service with suspected AC. Yes. Now, the patient recruitment in this study is a little hard to understand, uh, but the long and short of it, so 265 occlusive MI patients were identified, and then 108 of these patients met STEMI criteria. So that means the sensitivity was 41%. Not good. Not good for any test that we're looking for. When they blinded the investigators and had them look at the ECGs, of the 265 that had occlusive disease, had occlusive MIEKGs, they were able to identify occlusive myocardial infarction earlier in 146 of those patients. So remember, 108 had ST elevation, so they were able to identify an additional 38 patients earlier for cardiac cath. And we're talking an average of about three hours earlier as compared to the STEMI and STEMI paradigm. And what were the common ECG findings in patients with no STEMI criteria but occlusive MI on cath? Well, here you go. Subtle ST elevation that doesn't meet STEMI criteria 83% of the time, and then reciprocal ST depression or negative hyperacute T waves in 82% of the time. All these other EKG findings are hovering right around 50%. So only six cases or 4% of the occlusive MI patients had none of these seven findings. 92% of the patients had two or more of these EKG findings. So that should give you a lot of food for thought. Now, similarly, in the difficult trial, which is primarily a Turkish study, and Steve Smith is one of the co-authors that's listed, the investigators asked if shifting from a STEMI and STEMI paradigm to an OMI NOMI paradigm would result in better identification of the patients that need acute reperfusion. And so what did they do? They took two cardiologists, they blinded them to the angio and outcomes and had them look at the EKGs and decide, is this occlusive MI or not? And then there were also two interventionalists who looked at a bunch of the cats to identify who's got occlusive MI with culprit lesions and who doesn't. They had a thousand patients in the STEMI, and STEMI, and in the control arm. And of the thousand and STEMI patients, 282 were reclassified as occlusive MI based on the EKG. When they looked specifically at the NSTEMI ECGs and they identified these 282 that they could reclassify as occlusive MI, then they, they called those patients the NSTEMI A group and all the other NSTEMIs were NSTEMI B. What they found was that this NSTEMI A subgroup that had the occlusive MI on angiogram, they were more likely to have the occlusive uh, um, uh, artery on the angio, they had similar in-hospital mortality to STEMI as compared to the other end STEMI patients, and they had numbers that were closer to long-term mortality to the STEMI patients as compared to the other end STEMI patients. And so you can see this group fits more like the STEMI than the all other end STEMI patients. Now, this is still not a perfect paradigm. The difficult trial still missed 17% of acute coronary occlusion in NSTEMI patients. So we're getting better, but we're not quite there yet. So what's the takeaway from all this? Ultimately, it's more than just ST elevation on an ECG that should make the diagnosis of occlusive MI. You need to consider first your patient, their risk factors, their story, your suspicion, Look at their ECG. We need to move beyond ST elevation and start considering some of the other dangerous patterns that we know of. Look at the biomarkers. That should help add to the mounting evidence of whether or not your patient needs reperfusion. And then lastly, use echo at the bedside. And we just had a great lecture on the use of bedside echocardiography. And this is a time where we should be using echo to help us direct the management. Thanks so much for spending your Saturday with me. I appreciate it. And hopefully I've given you some food for thought.